Salvation. Well, can anyone come to God while deliberately ignoring his will? Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. I'm going to cite this in the Amplified Bible version. But the Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in the latter times some will turn away from the faith paying attention instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. Misled by the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared as with a branding iron, leaving them incapable of ethical functioning. This the amplified editors draw out. Old news item, February 2014. The UN Committee of the Rights of the Child lambasted the Vatican for protecting pedophile priests. Ah, well, so far, so good. The UN's got that. Yeah. But then the UN Committee also asked the Vatican to change its teaching on abortion, as in being for abortion, and homosexuality, meaning why are you so uptight? By changing its interpretation of just a few biblical verses, the Vatican responded by telling the UN Committee, colloquially speaking, butt out. <laughs> Stop violating our religious freedom and the rights of the church to set its own doctrine. Fast forward to news, new news item, December 18th, 2023. Okay, from the AP, Pope Francis, you know, head of the Roman Catholic Church, has formally approved allowing priests to bless same-sex couples with a new document explaining a radical change in Vatican policy by insisting that people seeking God's love and mercy shouldn't be subjected to, as a precondition, to a, quote, an exhaustive moral analysis, close quote, to receive this blessing by the church, by its priests. This document from the Vatican Doctrine's office suggests that church, the church's priests could bless individual homosexuals who are living together under some circumstances if the homosexuals involved didn't confuse such a blessing ritual with the church's sacrament of marriage. You know, they wanted to make sure you know they weren't dressed up, you know, in a suit for the fellow who was uh, the groom and a, uh, a dress for the fellow who was the bride. You know, this sort of thing—a white one. Anyways, speaking through the document, Pope Francis says, Ultimately, such a blessing offers people a means to increase their trust in God. The request for a blessing thus expresses and nurtures openness to the transcendence, mercy, and closeness to God in a thousand concrete circumstances of life, which is no small thing in the world in which he live. The Roman pontiff then added, it is a seed of the Holy Spirit that must be nurtured and not hindered. Well, turn with me now to the Gospels. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24, New Living Translation here. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weed seeds among the wheat and then slept away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weed seeds also sprouted and grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds! Where did they come from? Verse 28. An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and put the wheat in the barn. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 63, Amplified Bible here. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain clearly to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, 
The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, referring to himself. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is a devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So just as the weeds are gathered up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend the scandal on those things by which people are deceived, tricked, and led into sin, as the Amplified draws out. And all who practice evil, Coulter says, lawlessness, it's an anomia, which means leading others into sin. So the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and all who practice evil, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping. And as the Amplified notes, over sorrow and pain, people will be weeping, and grinding of teeth. Because some will be in distress, and they will be very, very angry. So you have those two things going on. When they're, you know, before the throne of the fire, there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Verse 43 and Jesus concluded in saying, Then the righteous, those who seek the will of God, will shine forth, radiating the new life, like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words, Jesus said. In a statement a few days after the release of the new document by Pope Pope Francis on the blessing of practicing homosexualities. Chris Vella, co-chair of the Global Network of Rainbow Catholics, called the doctrinal paper, quote, a milestone in the long journey towards equality. As a Catholic LGBTQ plus person married to my partner for the past five years, the decision by the Pope is a major milestone that confirms what we always knew in our hearts, that our relationships can be blessed, are indeed holy, and can be a blessing for our families and communities as well as the church, said Mr. Bella. In heralding the Pope's same-sex declaration, Francis uh, D. Bernardo, executive director of New Ways Ministry, called, uh, which advocates, by the way, this New Ways Ministry advocates for the inclusion of the LGBT community in the Catholic Church, he said, Mr. D. Bernardo said, The Vatican Doctrinal Office's previous claim that God does not bless sin has been uprooted by the new exhortation, God never turns away any who approaches him. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, Holman Christian Standard Bible. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6. Paul, so Paul saying to the Corinthians, who had more than a few moral challenges, said, However, we do speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord, Lord of glory. But as it is written, what eye did not see and ear did not hear and what never entered the human mind, God prepared for those who love him. Now let me ask this question. Who, and who are those who are authentically seeking God's love and mercy? Who are they? You know, talk is cheap. Many say they love God these days, but do they really? How can we discern between those who are sincerely seeking a relationship with the Bible's God and those who are merely saying so, whether in ignorance or in presumptuous self-will? 
Can human beings force the Bible's God to accept them as they are and bless them with eternal life on their own terms? Rather than on God's terms? Let's go to 1 John and the general epistles of the Apostle John. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. I'm going to cite this in the Coulter translation. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten by God, and everyone who loves him who begat also loves him who has been begotten by him. By the, this standard, we know that we actually, not hypocritically, but really, authentically, that, but that we know uh, that we love the children of God and the brethren of the church. You know, loving the brethren of the church, this is by authentically loving the brethren of the church, this is a sign to others on the outside that, you know, we are Christ's disciples. By this standard, we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. When we keep his commandments, this is the word for keep in the Greek is Strong's 5083, is tereo. Tereo is the lexicon defines it as to keep properly, to maintain, to preserve, figuratively, to spiritually guard, watching over, preserving, keeping intact. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Contrary to the preaching of many, a preacher, and it would seem the Pope. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. But as is written, what I did not see and ear did not hear... And what never entered into the human mind, God prepared for those who love him. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man that is in him? That's what separates us from the animals, the spirit of man that's in us. That's how we know, you know, we, we know, we speak, we, we have all these incredible things that human beings, natural, carnal human beings, that of what we can do. But who can know the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man that is in him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God it's understood that is in that person. Christ, you know, Christ said, if, if, if you don't have Christ, you know, if you don't have Christ's spirit, you're not his. Let's go to Acts 5 and verse 29. How do we receive the Holy Spirit of God? How can we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within us and to be authentic Christians, real Christians? What is the characteristic? What, 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 what must we exhibit that God will take notice of us and he'll put his spirit within us. Acts 5 and verse 29. Now on this occasion, this was a time when the church was first getting going after the first Pentecost. And the leaders of the Jewish religious community weren't happy. They hadn't been happy with Jesus. They weren't happy with his disciples proclaiming that they had murdered their leader <laughs> and, and that God had raised him, that he was a Messiah. I mean, this was, this was, this this was really, you know, getting getting them. <laughs> this was turning their crank. So they had hauled them in. They'd arrested them and brought them in before them before, you know, their tribunal to deal with them. And they were going to do something about it. But anyways, but Peter, when they were asked them, you know, why they were still preaching when they'd already threatened them once. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Anytime we come up into conflict with the authorities of this age, we must obey God rather than men. 
So you know, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, it's not just that power corrupts. It's, it's the fear of losing power that corrupts among leaders. But for those who are under, those who are subject to the coercion exercised by the leadership, it is the fear of that power that corrupts also people, average people. Peter and the rest of the apostles got this point. You know, you got to put it all on the line at times. And they were putting it all on the line. They said, Peter and the apostles replied, but we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. <laughs> that wasn't guaranteed to make them, <laughs> that was guaranteed not to make them friends <laughs> of their judges, Okay. God exalted this man to his right hand as a ruler and savior to grant repentance to Israel, to the elect of God, God's people, and forgiveness of sins. Verse 32, we are witnesses of these things, as is also the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those who obey him. God will give his spirit to those who obey him. He will not give his Holy Spirit to those who disobey him. Scripture is clear. Let's go to Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, New Living Translation. Mark 1 and verse 1, New Living Translation. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written... Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare the way, your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. You know, he was an advanced man. <laughs> Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. To repent of your sins means you acknowledge them and you are going to turn around and walk the other way. You are going to do the opposite of what was leading you into sin. Sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So you're going to, instead of breaking God's law, you're going to keep God's law. You're going to preserve it. You're going to maintain it. You're going to respect it. You're going to obey it. That people should be baptized and show that they had repented of their sins and returned to God. Verse 14, later on after, this is Mark 1, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. And he said what? He said, the time promised by God has come at last. That the Messiah should arrive. This incredible event. And he announced, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Jesus' message was, you have to repent of your sins. You can't just keep going and doing them. You have to turn away from them. And you, you have to be, with, it, you can't make excuses for not turning away. Do what you need to do. Go to Mark 9, verse 42. Jesus later on said in the gospel, Mark 9, verse 42, New Living Translation. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin... You know, if you're a leadership position and you're causing one of these little ones who believe in me to fall into sin, because you're not teaching them what is right from wrong, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. Have you ever seen a large millstone? I have, many, many times. To have one tied around your neck, you're going right down to the bottom. <laughs> Davy Jones' locker. Verse 43 then he, Jesus makes this point. 
he's pretty radical here. Jesus, you know, the, the Son of Man is getting pretty radical in this statement here in Mark 9, 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's, it's better to uh, enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of Gehenna, hell. But, you know, it's, then with two hands. So whatever it is in your life that's causing you to sin, cut it off! <laughs> However painful it might be. Because it's better for you to go into, you know, eternal life with, with missing something. And what is it that's causing people to sin? Whatever it is, take drastic action to stop it. As costly as that might be. I mean, Jesus was using the figurative. This is figurative. He's not talking about a literal hand or something else. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter into life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. In the general epistle of the apostle Peter. He's going to use a section about the rise of false prophets that uh, is prophesied. Peter was prophesying. You know, an apostle not only was teaching you the things that he'd seen with, uh, with Jesus, but he was also teaching you the things that were revealed by the Spirit of the things to come. Second Peter 2, verse 1. But in those days false prophets arose among the people, you know, anciently in ancient Israel, that happened. He says, you know, just as there will be false teachers among you. He's warning the church. There will be false teachers among you who will subtly introduce destructive heresies. Oh, yes. Subtly, gradually, bit by bit. Oh, it's not so bad. See, we can figure out a way to reason around this, rationalize around this, pour a little oil. It's, it's, don't get so upset. It will subtly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. He said, you know, you, you, you want to enter your life? You know, if something's holding you back that's sinful, get rid of it. bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways. Because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false arguments and twisted doctrine. Their sentence of condemnation, which God has decreed from a long time ago, is not idle, but is still in force. And their destruction and deepening misery is not asleep, but is on its way. For if God did not even spare angels that sinned, but threw them into hell and sent them to the pits of gloom to be kept there for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought the judgment of a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, who was tormented by the immoral conduct of unprincipled and ungodly men, for that just man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by what he saw and heard of their lawless acts, then, in light of the fact that all this is true, be sure that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial, and how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Verse 10, And especially those who indulge in the corrupt passions of the sinful flesh. <laughs> it's the sin nature here in the New Living, but really, you know, the, the sinful flesh, is just, I think it puts it King James, it's much more graphic. And despise authority presumptuous, 
See, they think they heck, they can do this. They think it's okay. They think it's whatever. They think it's progressive. Presumptuous and reckless, self-willed, and arrogant creatures despising the majesty of the Lord. They do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. You know, godly messages. Whereas even angels who are superior in might and power to us as is, is, is flesh, you know, flesh and blood. And do not bring a reviling, defaming accusation against them before the Lord. But these false teachers, like unreasoning animals, mere creatures of instinct, born to be captured and destroyed, reviling things they do not understand, will also perish in their own corruption. You know, verse thirteen: suffering wrong which is destined for their punishment as the wages of doing wrong. They counted a delight to revel in the daytime, living sensuously, reveling. They are stains and blemishes on mankind, reveling in their deceptions even as they feast with you. See, they're... The, they're the seed the devil sows among God's people. They are there among any who are trying to worship the true God. Satan always sows his, his, his seeds to try to corrupt uh, those around them. They have eyes full of adultery, constantly looking for sin, enticing and learning away unstable souls. My pastors, when you have something like this, you got to get them out of the congregation. You just fellowship them. You kick them out. Having hearts tainted in greed, they are children of a curse. Not a blessing. A curse. Abandoning the straight road, that is the right way to live, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of the false teacher Balaam the son of Beor, who loved the reward of wickedness. Let's read a little bit about this <laughs> Balaam, the son of Beor, because uh, probably most people these days don't know the story of Balaam. If you open your Bibles, here to, let's go to uh, Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. You know, when Numbers 22 opens... Israel at this point in time, children of Israel, God's people, under the leadership of Moses, were beginning to occupy the promised land. They were on what we call now the East Bank, the area sort of generally where Jordan is and the Golan Heights and this sort of thing that's in the present geography names that we're familiar with. And... They were fulfilling the promise to occupy this land just as God had promised to Abraham that he would give it to his seed. See, God controls. <laughs> he, he has the title deed to this world and he will allow whoever he wants to live on it. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're tenants. <laughs> we're, 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 we're leasees. We're <laughs> So he, they were just beginning to occupy the promised land. And the chosen people of Israel had destroyed Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan, and they had occupied their lands. As I said, this is now, we would know it more, be familiar with the land, the east bank of the Jordan River. We have here, in uh, verse 12, we have this whole thing. Uh, it goes through here in chapter 22, that this this fellow, this Balak, um, who was the uh, king of Moab, he and all of his uh, council, his elders, and the Midianites, they were all scared of what Israel was doing. And so they decided, well, you know, we've got to get some spiritual power on our side. And you have verse 5, Therefore Balak sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, by the river of the land of the children 
of his people to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and are dwelling across from me. Therefore, I pray you, come now and curse this people for me. For they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall prevail, so that we may strike them, and so that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. This fellow Balaam had a pretty good reputation. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a pretty good reputation at that point in time. And by the way, the Balaam's name has been found archaeologically. <laughs> you know, the interesting the thing is, okay, so he's, this is not fiction. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian set out with the rewards of divination in their hands. Okay, divination to ask of the gods favor to curse the Israelites. So they were going to pay for this, okay? And they came to Balaam and spoke the words of Balak to him and said to him, and Balaam said, Stay here tonight, and I will bring you the word again tomorrow as the Lord will speak to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. He made them a party, of course. And God came to Balaam and said, What men are these with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, which covers the face of the earth. Come now and curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Verse 12. Okay, what's God's position on this? What does he say to Balaam? Verse 12. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And so Balaam gets in the morning, and he tells him, well, go into your land, you know, go back home. The Lord refuses to let me go with you. And so they, they went home. And Balak wasn't satisfied with that. He says, oh, he's bargaining. You know, this is the Middle East, right? <laughs> Some things don't change. He said, "Ah, oh, he wants more money. <laughs> We've got, we just we just started the negotiations. Okay, let's you know this is a long drawn out. This is how they do things in the Middle East, anciently as well as with us." And Balak sent leaders again, more numerous and more honorable than those. And they came to Balaam and said to him, "Thus says Balak, the son of the poor, poor, please let nothing hinder you from coming to us." For I will rise you up to very great honor, and I will do whatever you say to me. Please come and curse this people for me. And Balaam here says, well, he said to him, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord, uh, my God, to do less or more. I say, he, he's got that right. Balaam had a certain, he, he saw something. But Balaam also was greedy. <laughs> he was covetous. He wanted, he wanted this, all this silver and gold. He wanted it. He really did. He says, all right, well, stay here with me tonight, and that I may know what the Lord will say to me. And the Lord came to Balaam that night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise up and go with them, but only the word that I shall say to you, that you shall do. God knew his guy. He knew what was in Balaam's heart. He knew he wanted this gold and silver. He really wanted to do what they wanted him to do. Even though God said, no, nah. Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, the donkey said, what have I done to you? that you have beaten me these three times. And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have mocked me. I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey upon which you have ridden ever since I was yours to this day? Was I ever known to do so to you? And he said, no. Meanwhile, consider this. Balaam is having this conversation with the donkey, and Balaam's into it. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? Behold, I came out to withstand you, because your way is perverse before me. And the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now I would have killed you and saved her alive. 
And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the way against me. He sinned because he wasn't willing to do what God had told him the first time. I'm blessing these people. You can't curse them. I'm not going to curse them. But Balaam wanted the money. He wanted to finagle. He wanted to lobby. He wanted to pressure. He wanted to manipulate. He wanted to do whatever oily, slippery thing he could to get his way, to get the money. Now, if it pleases you, I will go back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you and that you shall speak. So he went with them. You can read the, you know, some more of this. He goes on. You know, you have this whole thing of he, he offers these sacrifices and, and, and he continues to disappoint Balak. And Balak, keep, you know, he says, well, no, I, I can't, you know, God has said I got to bless and not curse. And Balak is getting upset and he said, oh, God, I'll give you more money and, and let's go to a different place and try, you know, because they're pagans, you know, let's go to a different mountain, you know, and we'll have a different high place and, and do some different stuff. And, yeah, uh, but no, that's not what it was going to be. And finally, you come to the conclusion of this thing, chapter 23, Numbers chapter 23. And let's go to verse 18, 23 and verse 18. Well, verse 16, And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again to Balak and say this. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the leaders of Moab were with him, and Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, and listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. See, men lie. Men should repent. God is not a man. He does not lie. He does not need to repent. When he says something, it is right. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall he not fulfill it? Behold, I receive the word to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not seen iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Well, needless to say, Balak wasn't happy. But you know, but you know, Balaam's. You know, after all this, you know, Balaam said, "Well, maybe there's another way of doing this. <laughs> maybe you know, if, if God hasn't seen perverseness in Israel, maybe we can sow some perverseness in Israel and sow some corruption among them. And how are we going to do it? Oh, verse. Let's go to Numbers 25, verse one. And Israel dwelt in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people to the sacrifice of the gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And then they had sex. <laughs> They're all around the altar, you know, it was an orgy. They were doing all this. So, you know, Balaam's counsel was, okay, let's sow some verses among Israel, so maybe then we can curse God. Uh, God can have cursed them, curse the people for us. And then you can give me all the money. And you have this whole story about Phineas, you know, who, who you know, people were falling for it, for it. Sex is a great lure. It's a great hook. <laughs> they were, they, you know, you want to entice people? Well, he, you know, you appeal to their lust. You appeal to their sensuality. You, get, you can get them hooked on this. Nothing's new. This is what, you know, it was satanic. Balaam understood this. But some of the leaders of Israel weren't going to go that way. And you have the whole story here, Numbers 25, that you had Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, you know, saw one of the princes of Israel bringing in one of the uh, Midianite princes. And he was having sex and he took her in his tent and was having sex with her and all this sort of stuff. And Phineas went in there and, well, 
you know, Jesus said, cut off your hand if it's offense you. He didn't. He, he plugged them right to the ground with his javelin, you know. He, he killed them right then and there. He executed them. I'm going to stop God's anger and his plague on the children of Israel. You know, God had to clean out, and he did. There are all sorts of people who died because of that, because of what Balaam said. There were thousands and thousands of Israelites who, who died of God's people, who were snared, who were, you know, tricked. Sex is a powerful thing. You see here in Numbers 25, God said this to Moses, first uh, ch uh, chapter 25 of Numbers and verse 16. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, attack the Midianites who are there with the Moabites who were, you know, <laughs> who, who part and parcel, who were putting up their daughters, you know, as, you know, to, uh, you know to, to allure and entice and seduce the Israelite men. Attack the Midianites and strike them. For they trouble you with their lies, which they have deceived you in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the ruler of Midian, your sister, who was stricken in the day of the plague because of Peor. So they were going to go and deal with the source of this corruption. So what do they do? If you turn over a little bit farther, we see the end result of this. Because God has the people fight back against the corruption and the enticement. And he goes here, let's go to verse 31. In chapter 31, so they're going to go out to war against them. The Israelites are going to go attack the Midianites, before, because of what they're doing, trying to subvert them before God. And so God says, oh, well, you know, let's, let's deal with it. And he's a chapter 31 of Numbers and verse 7, and they, the Israelites, warred against Midianites, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. And they killed the kings of Midian, besides the rest of the slain, Evi and Recham and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian, they also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword, because he was there as their counselor and advisor of trying to teach them how to pervert and seduce the children of Israel from their relationship with God by making them corrupt before him in their sight by sexual immorality. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. Revelation 2 and verse 12. New Living Translation. Revelation 2 and verse 12. Message to the church of God in Pergamum. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Seems like, you know, God has an angel to watch over different, you know, this is the churches that he saw. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has its throne. Yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. Corrupting them sexually, with immorality, licentiousness. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In the same way you have some Nicolaitans among you who are following the same teacher. Repent of your sin, verse 16, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, anyone who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. saying to everyone who has been victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9. I'll be with the Holman Christian Standard Bible here for a moment. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9. The coming of the lawless one you know, man of sin, lawless, lawless meaning 
you know, he's not living by God's law, not teaching law, but by, by God's law. He's not keeping, he's not observing it. He's not maintaining it. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working. Well, no surprise there. Who hates God's way? God's law. It's Satan. Satan hates God's way of life, which is taught and enshrined in God's law, which teaches us the difference between right and what is wrong in all areas of life, including sexual matters. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. You know, people have always been, you know, you put on a good uh, snake oil, you know, medicine show and you deceive people. They perish, why? Because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. People perish because they don't accept a love of the truth. They don't really, you know, if you loved God's word, you would know that some things are wrong, have always been wrong. Certainly true with the sexual behavior. God is a holy God. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. Second Thessalonians 2, 11. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false, so that all will be condemned, those who do, did not believe the truth but enjoyed unrighteousness. See, Balaam didn't believe the truth by following and acting on what the truth was. He shouldn't have got out of his place to begin with the first time. He shouldn't have gotten on that donkey. He knew what God's teaching was. But he didn't believe the truth, but he enjoyed unrighteousness. He wanted that money. Eventually cost his life. Of course, they could, the Israelites did catch up to him. Titus, Titus 1 and verse 16. The letter up here to his fellow servant, fellow minister. Paul's writing Titus, and he said, he's talking about the problem of these people who don't believe the truth but enjoy unrighteousness. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. This verse is translated in the New Living. They deny him by the way they live. They deny God by the way they live. See, they profess him. They profess to know God. They profess to seek after God. They profess to all these things, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable, disobedient, disqualified for any work. Amplified says, unfit and worthless for a good work, deed, or enterprise of any Kind. Let's go to the general epistle of the Apostle John. See, let's switch apostles here for a second. This apostle, this this apostle uh, shop. <laughs> you know this. You know I, I've been in the Church of God long enough as elder. You know I mean. <laughs> You know, sometimes you get people just like Balaam. They want their way. You know, they, they, they really do. They want to do what they want to do. I want to divorce this woman because of it. I want to divorce this man because of whatever. They want what they want. So they'll minister shop. They'll shop around, you know, if I say no, they'll go to somebody else. They'll go to somebody else. So finally they find somebody who says, yes, that's just okay. Then they feel good. <laughs> First John chapter 2 and verse 4, English Standard Version. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Is that clear? Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. First Timothy chapter three and verse fourteen, Amplified Bible Version. Paul writing Timothy, saying, Although I hope to come to you before long, <laughs> 
I am writing these instructions to you so that if I am detained, you may know how people ought to conduct themselves in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and stay, you know, the prop and support of the truth. The church of the living God, you know, we're held up by the truth, the truth of God. God's word is the truth, John 17, 17. How we ought to conduct ourselves. In the household, it's very important. You know, we're, we're given opportunities in our families to, you know, learn how to live in the household, God's household, by how we live in our own households. It's very important. Ephesians 5, verse 22, oftentimes, we don't think of it necessarily from the standpoint of how we're going to be living in God's household, but this is, this is what the apostle is saying. Ephesians 5, 22, he said, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, you know, doing what is right according to God's word. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. Christ is head of the church. It's not the Pope. That may be news to a lot of people. Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit themselves and everything to her husbands. See, the church submits itself to Christ, to Christ's instructions, to Christ's command. And if you believe what the, what the New Covenant Scriptures says and the Gospels, Jesus said, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And he has the whole thing of talking about he was the God, he was the Lord of the Old Covenant. He stood on top of Mount Sinai and he gave them the Ten Commandments and then he gave them in the rest of his law. He told them what he expected of them sexually what was right and what was wrong. And he repeats it in the, you know, in the epistles of Paul. What kind of sexual behavior was right? Homosexuality was a big deal in the Greco-Roman Empire. I mean, they practiced a lot of it, but it wasn't acceptable in the church. Very clear. Apostles didn't accept it. The church submits itself to Christ. Christ does not submit himself to the church. Let's get it straight. We as Christians, as individuals, if we must repent and come to Christ, we submit ourselves to Christ. He doesn't submit himself to us. The church is to be a light to the world, not to be and to transform the world eventually under the rule of Christ and the kingdom of God, not to be transformed by the word world into adopting its ideologies. What's happening in the Catholic Church now is it's, they're simply, you know, they're conforming themselves and adopting to the, what, the political correct, the, the time that we have right now. That's what Francis is doing. There's no big mystery. Titus 1 and, and verse 1. From Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, I was sent to help the faith of God's chosen people, of the elect. You know, Paul was in the service. He was to lead people, to stimulate, to promote their faith, and to help them know the truth that shows people how to serve God. That faith and that knowledge comes from, or leads to, the hope the confidence or certainty of life forever, which God, who never lies, <laughs> see, you know, right from that time, you know, <laughs> the Balaam, he was, God is not a man that he should lie, <laughs> the son of man that he should repent. That which God, who never lies, promised to us before time began. At the right time, God let the world know about that life through preaching. He entrusted me Paul said, with that work, by the command of God, our Savior. Jesus Christ is God. That'll blow minds. Verse 7. 
For an overseer, as God's administrator, must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tuppered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving that which is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught. So he will both be able to encourage with sound, wholesome teaching, and to refute those who contradict it. We are to be faithful to the message that was taught in the Gospels, in the Scriptures, in God's law, the re God's revelation. We're to be faithful to that. We're not trying to be popular with the world. <laughs> We're not trying to please the UN or any of these other people. Verse 15, uh, here I'll go in and, and I'll just uh, cite this one and expanded. To those who are pure, all things are pure. But to those who are full of sin, that is, they are defiled, they are polluted with sin, and do not believe nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences have been ruined. They've been defiled, they've been polluted. <laughs> Verse 16, they say they know God, but their actions show they do not accept him. Or as other versions, that their actions show that they deny him. They are hateful people, detestable, abominable. They refuse to obey. They are useless unfit, disqualified for doing anything good. Titus 2 and verse 1, Titus 2 and verse 1, Paul saying to his fellow elder Titus, as for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Promote the living that reflects wholesome teaching. Don't bless that which <laughs> reflects unwholesome teaching and is polluted and defiled. Teach older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. The older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely, to be pure, devoted to home life, to do good, to be submissive to their husbands, that they will not bring shame on the word of God. We don't want anyone to discredit, malign, or blaspheme the teaching God gave us because, you know, we're being hypocrites. <laughs> you know, we say we're Christians and then we, we do all these hypocritical things. See, that's part of the problem. Pope Francis, you know, is supposed to be this big spiritual leader. The world looks at him that way. Oh, he's the, big, he's the top Christian. He's not. Okay, that's not the truth. But they look at him as that. But he's bringing shame on the word of God by what he's doing. Titus 2 and verse 6. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind, that everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. You know, slaves must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. They must not talk back or steal, or, but must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. By doing this example, even, even, even if you are you know, a slave, and in the Roman Empire, that's how the Roman Empire, there were tons of slaves. The church was composed, had a lot of slaves. Because, of course, it, it told the truth of where ultimately their life, but they, even in slavery, they could, you know, shine the light of the gospel by, by setting a right example. Titus 2, verse 11. 
That is the way we should live, because God's grace that can save everyone has come. It's been revealed. Verse 12, it teaches. God's grace, it teaches us. It disciplines us. It trains us to turn away from, to reject, to deny ungodly living. And the evil things the world wants to do. Instead, that grace teaches us to live in the present age in a wise, self-controlled, and right way. In a way that shows we serve God. We should live like that while we wait for our great hope in the coming of the glory, the glorious manifestation of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us that we might that he might pay the price to free us, to redeem us, to ransom us from all evil. Anomia. He's ransoming us from lawlessness, that utter disregard of God's law. He came, he suffered, he died to free us from sin, that we might be pure and holy in his sight, not that we should live in sin. And to make us pure people, who belong only to him. People who are always wanting, zealous to do good deeds. Say these things and encourage the people and tell them what is wrong in their lives. You know, rebuke them, admonish them with all authority. Do not let anyone treat you as if you were unimportant. And then, you know, the bottom line of all this is, when we think about it, in the church of God, we must not tolerate among us and call them brethren. Anyone whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who wants to, you know, because they, they want to what they want, and they're willing to trip up and seduce those that God is working with, those whom God is calling. They are, such people are the evil seed that Satan sows among the good seed. But our job, my job, your job, is to love the truth and to live it and not accept, not allow ourselves to be tricked and deceived by the, the cunning teachings of these false teachers so that we will be, set a good example for others about what the truth is. We must have that love for the truth and for God's word that we will not be taken in and those who are around us and whenever we have the opportunity, those we love will not fall for the deceptions that are being practiced at this present time as was prophesied. Let us be faithful, let us be steadfast, let us love God. And we manifest that love by keeping his commandments, by preserving it, by maintaining it, by teaching it, by doing what is right and not making excuses and finagling and manipulating around deceiving ourselves, thinking somehow we can have our sin and be in God's kingdom. Let's, let's not do that. It's an error. Let's do what is right, that we may be in the kingdom of God. Repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus came. That's what we must live by. Till next week.